There we go. Ah, now it sounds different. All right. I still assume that my opening lines were heard, so I'll just continue. Anyway, um, so in fact, uh, Symphony 2 CMF is sort of a competitor in many ways, but also um, we're also collaborating already because in fact, a component that we wrote for the CMF project is being used for Drupal 8. So in that sense, uh, there's a sense of co-epetition going on. But um, I don't know if anybody is following me on Twitter. Last evening, I was sort of like sitting in my hotel room and wondering who will come to my session and why. Um, mostly the why was interesting to me. is like, well, what, what, do we, what do you want to learn here? So um, maybe first up, uh, a question. Who here has played with Drupal 8? OK. Who is aware that pieces of the CMF are being used for Drupal 8? Okay, one more hand. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, okay, let me try to figure out why you're here. So uh, who here is intending to use the CMF potentially to do CMS work? Nobody, okay, good. <laughs> so are you here because you just want to know what the comp competition can do so that you can better sell Drupal against it? Is that the reason? Okay. Uh, or you're just here because you like technology, and it sounds like fun technology, okay. Um, so there's, a, there's one piece in there in the CMF that I think, that I really, really hope is going to be a major piece of your Drupal future for Drupal 9. Not Drupal 8 necessarily, maybe in a Drupal 8 module, which is our content repository. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very exciting uh, piece of technology that actually, um, I presented together with Damian Tonneau in uh, Denver, at, at DrupalCon in Denver, um, where we sort of, everybody in the room sort of agreed, this is like a great future to look forward to, but it's not happening for Drupal 8, so we're talking, I don't know, 2018 or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, without further ado, let me get started. Um, actually, I, I still have one more disclaimer. So this slide deck, uh, it's open source. I was the original, original author of it. It has seen some changes. But the first couple slides I wrote, and, uh, and I wrote it for not a Drupal camp audience, but I think it still applies. And uh, it actually has been vetted by Larry Garfield. So um, don't be shocked. Uh, just keep going uh, and then wait with your tomatoes until like, I don't know, the fifth or sixth slide, okay? So let's get going. Um, so again, this, these slides were not written for a Drupal audience. Um, so Drupal is awesome, um, and I totally agree with that. And so the, the no really was because this was not for a Drupal audience, and many non-Drupal audiences are kind of in shock when I say that Drupal is awesome. So um, you're still with me here. Um, and to me, uh, <laughs> Oddly enough, I don't see Drupal as a platform, um, even though in our company we do use it in some cases as a platform. I think it's a great end user product because it's installable and it's very empowering for end users. They can do a lot of things from the user interface. And obviously, you can do some more things, also coding and, and, and uh, advancing the platform uh, or using it as a platform. But that, is, to me, is the, the, in, the cool thing about Drupal, is that it has this powerful end user interface. Um, and it also has a brand name. Uh, so we have, at the company I work for, Leap in Switzerland, we have customers coming to us and saying, we want to do Drupal, can you do Drupal? And then we say, yeah, we got Drupal people, we can do this. Um, and uh, uh, so this is, a, this is obviously very exciting uh, because you don't need to start trying to sell them the open source stuff. Um, they already know this. This is why they're coming to you and they know that this is a good product and you don't, like three months in the product, you don't have to explain yourself that you, you've chosen Drupal uh, because they did that choice. But to me, uh, we, or especially in our company, we experience a lot of pain points with development. Um, you know, the, the biggest problem that we've had is how to deal with uh, going from staging to production and then taking stuff back that was done in production and bringing that back. Um, that's just a gigantic pain. Um, and, and so when we set up to do the CMF, uh, we wanted to do something that is very developer-focused. So in that sense, uh, 
I'm using the word focus. This morning there was a lot of talk about, talk about focus and not thinking about you uh, as a platform, but more as a product. But in a sense, we are trying to build a platform here, but we are also trying to be focused. So we don't have the same. We don't. We don't want to build an end-user product that you can install and that end-users can work with. We're trying our focus group are developers. Um, so that's uh, trying staying with the theme of having a focus, but at the same time, we're building a platform for developers. So, and that, I think it's part, part of the problems with Drupal is the history, uh, because it was a CMS first, um, or actually, uh, um, and then, you know, this platform idea just came about later, and now, with Drupal 8, you're making a huge step, you know, in the direction of a platform, but, you know, it's quite hard to, to turn around that ship, and, and then, you know, how, how you're dealing with your existing user base and things like that, so it's not trivial. You, you can't just break BC entirely, and that's, in that sense, like when we talked in Denver about how great PHP CR would be the content repository specification, the reality is that you can't just do that because, you know, you have this user base and you have this original focus that led you to a certain API that doesn't allow you to just jump ship over to something new. And, you know, there, there are other issues that, you know, I collected from, from the teams internally at, at, at Leap, um, you know, that are... are um, uh, working with Drupal, and again, many of these things uh, Drupal is addressing in Drupal 8. Um, uh, so that's, um, in my sense, a very, very good positive step forward, and that's, you know, we're collaborating, so, um, you know, I, I have no hard feelings, of course, that you're doing this. I think it's great, and Leap will continue to do Drupal stuff as well, uh, in parallel to the CMF stuff that we're doing. So, um, and again, like I said, I actually had Larry look at these slides before I published them for the first time, and he, he agreed with many of these points that we fo thought were lacking, and, um, and you, know, uh, you know, Drupal 8 is trying to fix these, and I think there's this running, uh, like, uh, a gag that I, or a joke that I have with Larry that he keeps saying that he's trying to make sure that um, the CMF will just be a tech demo for whatever Drupal greatness comes in the future. Um, so, yeah, and that's fine with me as well. So, I, I, one of these previous slides, I, I talked about not invented here syndrome, and, and, you know, again, Drupal is laying that off quite aggressively, uh, maybe too aggressively for some, um, but I think that's great. Um, in the same sense, now, we're coming about and we're trying to build something again for the content management space, and, you know, there's plenty of choice already. So, in that sense, um, you know, we might be pointing the finger, but we should maybe point it at, at ourselves. And, um, so again, one key piece here is that we're actually trying to collaborate with everyone in the PHP CMS space uh, as much as possible, and we're trying to build tools that they can use uh, to build this, uh, a better CMS in the future. And we're trying to do that by building on top of specifications um, that have existed, not necessarily in, only in the PHP world, but in the entire CMS world. Um, and we're trying to do it in such a way that um, it becomes usable within a re reasonable amount of time. Uh, we're not trying to build some ivory tower either. Uh, and maybe one more interesting bit, I don't know who is aware of that, but this routing component that Drupal 8 is using that we wrote for the CMF project is also being used by Easy Publish. So now, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Drupal is collaborating with Easy Publish through us, um, and uh, I think that's very exciting. Now, um, Symphony 2 CMF, the F stands for framework, so we're trying to be a little bit what Symphony 2 is for general web development, we're trying to do that for CMS. So we're not trying to build the next CMS, we're trying to build tools to enable people to build the next CMS, and this can be a general purpose CMS, so for example in Austria there's a company that is trying to build a CMS that is dedicated to um, mid-range uh, industrial companies like between 200 to 1,000 employees that are building, for example, machines that are sold globally, but that have maybe a web team uh, of one or two people that have to maintain a website that is uh, translated to, you know, several sub-regions around the world like China, la 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 la, so they have like 50 or maybe 100 sub-sites uh, with different translations, and so they're building this CMS for this very niche market, uh, very focused. Um, but at the same time, 
the other target group is just build people building highly custom CMS for a single uh, website where they think if they take an out-of-the-box CMS like Drupal or whatever, um, they would have to take so many things out that you know, the first two months they would just be spending uh, taking things out that are not, necessarily for, not ne necessary for this product or this project uh, before they can even start doing the custom development. So it's sort of going from the other uh, side, and this is sort of what I try to um, uh, put into the title. And so like, if you have such a general purpose tool like Drupal, uh, in many ways you're sort of a, a stonemason. You have this gigantic block of features, and then you go and you chisel away, and you take little pieces out to make it exactly what the customer wants. And the idea with the CMF is that it's more like a 3D printer. You envision what you want, and then you have all the tools, and you pick exactly the tools you want, and then you just build up exactly uh, the final solution. And obviously, I'm, I'm slanting this a little bit, like the 3D printer, of course, is currently the cool hype thing, and stonemasons not necessarily. Um, and obviously, there are different uh, uh, places, like if, if indeed you're using most of the feature set from Drupal, then probably the CMF does not make sense to use, um, because you, you will have to do a lot of this building up, uh, because it's in fact not as easy as on a 3D printer. You just put in your uh, 3D uh, um, uh, you know, image or whatever, and you press a button. You, obviously, there's a lot of work involved building up a custom CMS on top of the CMF. We're trying to make it as easy as possible, but it is uh, you know, a, a significant uh, time investment. Um, so at the beginning of a project at Leap, we're now looking at this and we're saying, OK, what is the feature set that we expect to be using? Does this fall into where Drupal has us covered? Yes, then we're using Drupal. No, then we're looking at the CMF. Um, this is our mission statement. Um, so again, the focus is entirely on developers, not on end users. Um, and you know, we're building tools uh, for scalability, usability, usability, documentation, and testing. I would generally say we're pretty good on the scalability part pretty good on the documentation part, pretty good on the testing part in terms of usability because we don't have that many UI elements that we're providing. Uh, we're pretty bad or non-existent, however you want to call it. Um, so what is the content management system? So, um, or what is content management? And I think that's something that many uh, CMSs sort of have forgotten. Um, I think they've become page administration systems and not content administration systems. So when we were uh, thinking about what to do for the CMF, we, we, we wanted to go back to that basic again and think more about content. I think this is more important than ever, uh, mostly because uh, for, for a long time, you only really needed to manage pages uh, on a single output device, a browser, at a, you know, you picked your resolution that was your favorite, um, and that kind of worked. So I think that was a, like a decent simplification, but nowadays, obviously, that doesn't apply anymore. There's so many different de output devices, so many different channels that you want to get your content out, and also where it was traditionally that maybe companies were focusing on their print first, and then you know, they were maybe copying some data to the web applications. Nowadays, the web application is sort of the, the, the goal th uh, or the, the thing that they start off from, and then they expect to also drive the print from whatever they're entering in their web systems. Um, so really, there's the, the, not only the multiple device channels, but also the multiple output channels in, you know, in terms of print and, and, and things like that, or TVs and, and, and all that stuff. So, in a sense, you, you, you first start off with content, and then, you know, that is the second step, is trying to give that content some uh, navigational structure, some URL structure. That is something that should come second. It's not the thing that you first do, that you don't create a pay, you don't start off by saying, here, on, on this piece of the website, I want to add some new content. It's more like, I have content, and then, um, you might want to think about where to put that content, or even if you want to expose that content. So we, we uh, very much try to emphasize the separation uh, in the architecture that we were building. Um, and I, I, will, I will show you later a little bit more what, how that looks like. 
The other thing is, and I, I touched upon this, I mentioned the word PHPCR, that stands for PHP, C, uh, PHP Content Repository. And that basically comes from the realization that we were looking at, at how CMSs were, were dealing with storage. Uh, and most CMSs in the PHP world are using relational databases, and obviously they have these challenges to deal with, like how to deal with this unstructured data um, that you know, does not fit into a table structure and in, in this entire relational theory. And obviously nowadays there are lots of choices for this um, in the NoSQL uh, world. Uh, although personally I, I really despise the term NoSQL, let's call it more like document databases or something like that. And they really solve this, uh, this situation. And, and as far as I know, like in Drupal, in Drupal 7, there were already big steps towards you know, enabling using MongoDB for storage. And I think in Drupal 8, um, you can get rid of MySQL or some other relational database entirely, or at least that's the goal. Um, so that's, you know, great, uh, a step in that direction. Now, the problem, of course, is with NoSQL databases or document databases is that they're not built for hier tree hierarchies, um, which is something that you will most likely need for a content management system. And so then you need to build another thing on top of these to deal with that. Um, there, are, there is sort of a, another niche uh, database group called the graph databases that sort of deal with that, but they're then not necessarily ideal. They're mostly focused sort of on relationships and are not so strong when it comes to actually sh storing structured data itself. And then you have more things that you want. You want versioning, you want access controls and, uh, and things like that. Uh, you want UUIDs and all that goodness. And so we realized um, that uh, when you look at most of these content management systems, they have the problem that many of their APIs are very complex because they've evolved uh, quite a lot over the years. They don't, nobody has, or very few content management systems have really sat down and said, okay, this is all the use cases that we have. Let's build a consistent API and then let's implement that. It's more like, this is what we have. This is where we want to be, so let's morph it slowly one by one. And you know, that's something that's happening with Drupal. And obviously, this can get you to a very good end result, but uh, either you're just creating a lot of pain with backwards compatibility, and as far as I know, Drupal is queried, or at least it's uh, contrary to my, my, let's say, WordPress is more willing to break BC, but of course, again, the jumps cannot be too big, or you just lose your entire user base. So, what we decided then to do is to actually try to address this from the ground and really look at all the features that you need for a storage API um, and then come up with a consistent solution for that. And in order to do that, we decided actually the most sensible thing to do is to take the Java content repository, content repository specification and adopt that or bring that to the PHP world. Um, because they have, you know, more than a decade they've spent trying to actually look at all the use cases for storage you have in a content management system and try to uh, iron out a, a specification that deals with exactly that problem. Um, so all the things that I mentioned before, full text search, versioning, ACLs and things like that, that is all covered in their API. And we took that entire philosophy, that concept and brought it to PHP. And I think that, um, uh, you know, gives us a really a, a big step forward and sort of like really having a consistent API. But what is even more exciting is that we've actually made it, uh, we've, we have one implementation of this uh, specification that actually uh, builds on top of the reference implementation of the JCR. So for um, when you're running uh, the CMF, you can run it on top of a, cl a clustered, highly performant, full text search enabled via Lucene, Java implementation, but you can also run it on top of SQLite with no server daemon at all, and, uh, uh, and no Java at all. And so you have these huge, uh, huge range of scalability that you have uh, available, where most other CMSs, they basically try to build one solution that fits all, you know, maybe some additional flags, I don't know, some memcache magic to do some caching here and there, but essentially, you know, whatever runs the White House website is the same thing that runs, uh, or the same logic in terms of storage that runs your little uh, private blog or whatever that you created with Drupal. And with this uh, PHPCR specification, you have the ability to replace the implementation of the storage logic uh, without having to touch your business logic at all. And um, I think that's a very exciting proposition. Um, let me skip that real quick. Um, yeah, I just mentioned that. 
And um, so I mentioned implementations, and this is really the core concept. So there are multiple separate implementations of the storage logic. Um, and you, that really is, 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 is very significant. So there's Jackalope, which is written in PP, and that can either use Jackrabbit, which is this Java implementation, or it can store it directly into a relational database. Now, there's a separate project, uh, Midgard. I don't know who's familiar with the Midgard CMS project. They've been around for over a decade as well. Um, and they've done another implementation in C. Um, and that was really interesting because we have a big test suite that was testing uh, our implementation, the Jack Jackalope implementation. And when they came about, they actually exposed several bugs in our uh, test suite where they were like, okay, this is you're saying this in the specification, but you're actually doing that, and you just cheated because you made your test pass that, right? So that was really, really important. And this really means that it is possible for you, for example, to create a new impl uh, implementation of the specification that is optimized for a very specific use case that you have. Um, I don't know, for example, you're saying, actually, I'm not using a tree structure that much, and therefore, I can simplify some of the storage pieces here and gain a lot of performance that way, for example. And that is all possible. Or you can just take one of the you know, existing implementations, fork them and tweak them and things like that, as long as you're still passing the test suite, uh, all the, the code that was written against PHPCR will continue to work. Um, and so PHPCR, um, and that, that I think is quite exciting, is, has actually been recognized by the, the JCR people as well. Um, so um, the lead of the JCR specification is actually has asked us to collaborate with the JCR team, and we've actually done several improvements to the specification um, that are sort of in the, JCR was sort of written against this application server model, right, where you have this long running process that keeps everything in memory and things like that. And PHP runs more on a client server model. So we've submitted several improvements to the specification, to the JCR specification, um, to make it run better in a client server model. And several of them, we've actually also sent some patches into for Jackrabbit, and we've improved Jackrabbit to work better for this use case that we have in the PHP world. And I think this is a sort of, we're not, we're, we're now collaborating, the Java world and the PHP world are now also collaborating. And I think that's, that's I don't know, I don't know, I don't actually know how to express how great I think this is. Um, at the same time, we then also re saw the realities in the Java world, and so the um, JCP lawyers then said that actually, you cannot put the PHP interfaces into the specification, um, but you can at least mention that PHPCR exists and, uh, and uh, you know, and have it in, in an appendix or something like that. So we're not really, really totally in the specification, but we are recognized by the specification. And I think that's, that's already a big step forward. Okay. Now, um, and then getting back to the uh, um, theme of focus, PHPCR is not a one-size-fits-all, everything stored database. Um, it really sucks if you want to do reporting with it, because it can't, right? You can't uh, put some data in that and run a group by to, I don't know, sum up, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know, if you have a shop, you, you cannot sum up the, 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 the prices in an order or something like that. That's not something that PHPCR covers. So there will be cases where you need to combine both, where you will want to have relational database, so in the web shop, you will have a relational database for your inventory, for your orders, uh, but you will want, probably want to use PHPCR for your product information, for your category structure, and things like that. And because we natively support UUIDs, you know, that's, it's, it's very possible to do that sort of thing. All right. Um, yeah, uh, the CMF is actually has had its first release um, just um, a short while ago, so the first day we released. There have actually already been production uh, websites running on top of the uh, CMF for over a year and on top of PHPCR for about, for actually two and a half years. Um, I think the biggest website uh, currently is Joyce, which is a TV channel uh, from Switzerland that actually is also now in, uh, in uh, Germany. Um, it's sort of the target group are young adults up to, I don't know, 20 or something like that. Website is, I don't know, I get uh, seizures when I look at it. 
because it has like, I don't know, lots of things flashing and moving and I don't know what. But uh, they felt that um, they, it was such a custom need that they had there that um, the CMF would be the best way to do it. Um, now, let me continue by first asking you what you want to hear next. Um, so, a uh, quick show of hands. So, I could go more into detail on PHPCR. I think that is probably the most relevant. Um, routing, I will probably shouldn't cover because we actually, in three hours, we have uh, somebody covering the routing system. Um, so, I think sort of the, the what is very relevant to you, group, uh, routing system is covered today. I'm quite sure. I can show you code. I can demo stuff. So, who is for PHPCR? Who is for showing uh, for looking at code? More, okay, and who's look for looking at demo, at a demo? Okay, so we're like demo code. Okay, let's go do that then. I'll do a demo code. Um, so let's jump over here then. So this is uh, our sandbox, which is basically this where we throw everything in that we have. It's not a CMS, it, the usability is horrible. Um, performance is also not great because it's not configured uh, to be highly performant. Um, but this is essentially what it looks like. Um, very standard look and feel, I guess. Uh, we have like a, a, a top bar area here. Let me get rid of that. Where, um, I don't know, you, you have like a breadcrumb here, you have then a navigation on, uh, and then you have a uh, main content area in the middle. Um, this main content area in the middle is actually, so here's some text here, and then there are several blocks of different types uh, embedded here. Um, so that's, that's all quite standard stuff. Um, what's interesting is that, um, actually maybe I, actually no, I shouldn't have clicked on that. I wanted to go, uh, let's go here. I think I broke something, ah, oh, damn it. Okay, I broke something, but um, yeah, this is actually my development setup, so I, I should have checked that again. Anyway, so this website is actually translated, so this switch to thing here should actually list other languages to go switch to. Um, the, the storage repository, this PHPCR thing that we have, we have a layer on top of it, uh, which actually maps to objects, which uh, implements uh, translations. So the idea is that whenever, you, whenever we have a request, we look at what the language of the request is, and then we configure um, this uh, object mapper to what the default language is, and then we just, uh, by default, pull out um, the content in the given language. It's not rocket science, but it should lead to, in practice, that you can do multilingual websites where in the front end you never ac ever have to talk to a uh, translation API or things like that because things are just automatically translated. What's quite interesting about it is that it also has fallback logic. So you can define like an order uh, to how to fall back. Um, uh, so, I don't know, for example, if you don't have the content in German, you automatically fall back to English. And this is actually dynamically configurable, so in theory you could even look at the browser preferences and dynamically configure that. Um, the translate, this, this, this logic of how, to, how translations are stored and how they are retrieved from the database, that's actually pluggable. Uh, we just out of the box have two different approaches. Um, but you could write your own that could, in theory, go to Google Translate and dynamically translate the content or something like that. Now, um, what's uh, under the hood, obviously, we're using Symfony 2. So whoever has, has dealt with Symfony 2, it's basically um, the familiar Symfony 2 structure. And uh, unfortunately, that on the side is a little bit small. But uh, essentially, what is rendering out um, the content is, you know, it's just basically uh, a controller, Symfony 2 controller. Um, actually, we have a, uh, we, we ship sort of a, a standard controller out of the box that, you know, doesn't, um, it's, yeah, it's not so fancy what it, what it does, but actually it's, it's quite powerful. So essentially when we, we have a request coming in, um, we, we look at the, the pattern, uh, we try to, we use the Symfony 2 routing system, um, uh, although we've extended it to make it possible to do dynamic uh, database lookups. And uh, so we look at the, the request coming in. So for example, here, um, we have slash yen coming in. And if I can open this briefly here, and this is where I come to the point where we're, we're talking about the separation between content and the actual routing and navigation. 
And uh, I hope I didn't break something here because this is loading way too slow. Oh, sh <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Sonata. I was working on a feature on the train, and I guess I didn't revert it properly. Um, so let's hope that this fixes it. Oh, so let's go to the... We have it online as well, so that's my fallback. Um, let's go to the admin here. Um, here in this example, we're not trying to be fancy. So this, uh, the Symphony 2 CMF obviously uses Symphony 2, and therefore you can use any authentication scheme that you want. Here we're just using HD Basic Auth, but uh, you know, I don't know. Symphony 2 supports Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. Um, so let's log in here. So here we have this tree structure. Um, and you know, there's you know media content. These are all like top-level um, pieces of structure, and uh, one of them is this roots. And this is basically a st structure that represents the entire URL structure of the website. Um, and all you do when you create a route is that you actually, um, and this is where I get to the point of also ugly usability. Um, so all you do here, you, you define your route, and you place it somewhere in the, in the routing tree, and then you just add reference to a piece of content, right? So the, the content stru uh, structure can be entirely different than the website structure. And you can have different trees optimized for different use cases. So you can have one for mobile devices, one for uh, web browsers, one for TVs, and things like that. And you can, you know, create a new, uh, you know, you can clone that tree structure and then modify it, and it's a very cheap operation because there's very l comparatively little data because you're not cloning the content then when you just want to mess around with the tree structure. So we just reference the piece of content that we want to have associated uh, with this route, and that's it. Um, and uh, so here you basically, here you see the sort of the tree structure of the website itself um, as a tree. And the same thing applies for the menu system. Again, here you're just building uh, a tree structure of menu items that reference either routes or content. Um, and if you're re referencing content, because of the reference that you have from routes to content, we can also figure what the route should be to that piece of content. Um, so you could have in the menu system, you can reference a piece of content and then you don't even care what the URL is because you know as long as there's a route pointing to that content, um, we will automatically figure that out for you. Uh, of course, I don't know if somebody's going to raise their hand. If you have multiple uh, multiple different routes pointing to the same piece of content, then it gets sort of random. Um, and uh, there's a hook that could enable you to make that non-random again. But um, anyway, so that's that's kind of like how how we're we're getting from a route to, um, to a piece of content. And then if you go back to the code, you see here is that since the route um, points to a piece of content, then we can already inject that piece of content into the, the controller, and you can render that out. Now let's have a look at um, a template. Um, and I don't know, actually, who here, I, I think, who here has worked with Symphony 2? So, okay, so I don't know, are, are you every, is everybody in shock uh, or something like that, if what I'm showing? I, I guess it's a fairly standard PHP code. Um, so essentially you have a controller, and, um, and maybe I should briefly explain that. So in the, the, in the Symphony 2 world, it's basically the controller is what get call, gets called somewhere after the routing um, and is responsible for generating the HTML output. Um, so that's kind of standard. And, um, and basically what you, you get sort of you get a request and then you t convert that to a response object and there's sort of a helper that does that and that helper method here um, all it really does is it uses the templating system to create a uh, response so it, it gets a template um, and a couple parameters and so let's look at a template um, so this is a twig template um, this is actually something that is also coming to Drupal 8 
uh, as far as I know. Um, and so here we just, uh, we can render out um, the content. This is uh, sort of a tweak helper that we created and this is something I will get to in a second. Uh, the blocks here, we are rendering out inside the template. Um, obviously, you could also do that in the controller itself. Um, but what we're doing here is that this is just a, a twig helper function. And uh, the name here, this can either be an absolute path or a relative path. In this case, it's a relative path. So what it means is it's going to look at the... So if you look at content here, we're at this homepage here. And then here is sort of a child to that content node. Um, and this is where the, the children, the, the additional children are. And so here we're basically just saying, um, please render out um, these blocks. Um, divisible by three means that it's uh, three columns and then uh, as rows, and you can also specify the child class and things like that. And this is why we're ending up with, um, oops, I should be here. This is why we're ending up with these three columns here, rendering out these blocks. Um, yes. And then inside the template, if you want, you can do stuff like this as well. Um, we have some additional helpers to actually do queries on the database as well. I wouldn't generally o overuse that. Um, you know, you don't want to start adding tons of uh, business logic into your templates. Um, so generally, I would recommend to convert that, you know, potentially into a block or things like that uh, instead of doing it in a template. Um, but that's that's essentially how you um, you know build a website. Now, um, this thing here is quite interesting, and um, and here we well we tried to collaborate with with Drupal, and to to a certain point we got there, um, and that is inline editing is, is something that we support out of the box. Um, with uh, but we're using something that's called CreateJS, and that was evaluated by Drupal, and I think. Um, I actually don't know exactly why it was decided not to use it in the end, uh, because the architecture that Drupal has chosen to use is very similar still. Um, it's ba based on Backbone.js. Um, so the Drupal 8 solution is built on Backbone.js, and CreateJS is also built on Backbone.js. Um, but anyway, the idea is that with this little helper here, we can uh, we take this, this is the variable um, with the um, uh, object instance of the, the content that was associated with the route. And with this little helper, we're basically saying, please convert that to RDF. And um, for that, it's using a very simple mapping file uh, that you can actually overwrite. So this is the, the default one, is, looks like this here. Basically says that, uh, um, that we have uh, a property title um, that should render it out as an H1 tag. We have a, a property body, and then we also have tags, which is supposed to be a list. And then we can also map that to schema.org schema um, uh, properties. And um, this, in turn, then renders out the RDF A in, into the, the final content here. Let's make that a little bigger. Um, so here we are. Sorry. Yeah, so here you see that, you know, it's using the H1 tag with the property schema headline. Um, and uh, this is very interesting, and uh, as far as I know, uh, Drupal also has very good support for RDFA, so I, I'm a, I don't know, I'm not sure if everybody's already aware of the advantages of this, but there are, there, there are two big ones. The first one, of course, is that Google and many of the other search engines nowadays really have very good support for RDFA, and so you get better uh, representation in the search results. But the other thing is that this means that we have semantic information in the, in the client available, and we can use that for the inline editing. So um, if I reload the page after having logged in, uh, do, 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 do. I can start, you know, I can click on stuff and just inline edit that. And uh, we have, you know, based on the different uh, schema.org types, we can choose what widgets we to use for, for editing. So, for example, if you have an address, you could also do like Google Maps widgets and things like that. Um, and then you just save that. So that's, 
in a sense, very similar to what uh, Spark is offering you in Drupal 8, and I guess they're also backporting that for Drupal 7. Um, the nice thing that our solution is that it's sort of independent of what we're doing with the CMF, so therefore we can leverage whatever work is being done by the CreateJS team, which is, uh, for example, CreateJS is also being used by Typo3, so again, we're collaborating and sharing uh, rather than doing our own little islands. And again, I don't know exactly what the reasons were where, why CreateJS was dropped, but that's, um, in my opinion, a big pity. Um, yeah, so um, th I think the last thing that I just want to mention here is that what was really interesting with, um, with, the, uh, with the CMF is that when I, when I teach this to people at, at the company I work for or any other Symphony 2 experienced developers, that they feel very comfortable with what, all the things that we're doing. All the paradigms are, we're, we're really com highly compatible with everything that's going on that people are know that uh, are working with Symphony 2 already. And so the learning curve is quite small for a Symphony 2 experienced developer. The only thing where sort of there is a challenge is teaching them this content repository API because that's, um, if you've never worked with a content repository, you always go with the relational database thinking. So they're always thinking about what's the database query that I need to write to get this data out. And I keep telling them, you just look up by path. You don't do queries. And if you have a list of things that you want, um, then most likely you actually want to persist that as a list of references in the content repository because then you get sca stable ordering. You enable your content authors to update the ordering, um, and that's something that a relational database out of the box does not offer you. So really, um, that's the biggest challenge in bringing people on top of the CMF. At the same time, the CMF was developed in such a way that it's also possible to, we've de de created lots of interfaces, and for example, again, the routing system, out of the box, we also support a implementation that works straight on a relational database. So even if, you're, if you don't, really don't want to use PHPCR, uh, we already we have a lot of features and interfaces that are relevant to people um, that are you know not so familiar or not so sure uh, with using a quantum repository API. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe one last thing that I should mention. So this is obviously we have 1.0 out. We're st we still have lots of uh, work to do both in terms of features, also performance optimization. It's, it's ready for production. You can do great things with it, but uh, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, to be really, really solid in, in all aspects. Um, and like I said, um, we're, we're, we're try our niche is just developers as our entire focus. Um, and that way, I think we can, we, it's a little bit easier for us to get to a good point um, than Drupal where you, are, you have developers as a target audience and end users as well. So that's obviously a big challenge. And in that sense, we're not really competing with Drupal, at least not for end users. For developer mindshare, yes, not for end users. Okay, uh, we have only a very, very short amount of time for questions. I'm sorry for that, but let's go. Yes, Klaus? Um, yes, I mean, so for example, here, this this piece here, I mean, this just lists out blocks of content. Um, and as you saw in the template, that was just, you know, one call saying, okay, you can either have a relative path over an absolute path, and then we'll just go and render that out. And that pieces of content, they can have a generically configured template uh, and, and business logic to render them out, or via configuration inside these blocks, you can also overwrite that. So yeah, you can do a lot of that, but yeah, absolutely. Um, here the idea is that you have so much custom logic that is not a one-size-fits-all, that you know you're going to need those development hours even if you use Drupal. So that's really sort of the, 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 the setup. And yeah, so we don't, um, obviously you could build 
a, bundle, a Symfony 2 bundle that allow, allows you to configure lots of things and go into the direction of Drupal. Um, and for again, for very custom needs, that might make sense. But um, yeah, uh, every CMF project will need a developer, uh, or maybe two or three or four, to do all the work. Yes? OK. Um, so again, uh, three hours, there will be a more detailed talk. But essentially, we, we follow the same interfaces, so that we're actually using some bundles that don't know about the CMF at all, that are built on top of the routing system, that just work out of the box. So we're using the same interfaces. There the two pieces that we created there, so one is a dynamic router that just allows you to do dynamic database lookups, where with the Symfony 2 standard router, it only works with statically configured routes. So we can do a dynamic database lookup, and based on the database lookup, determine if that route exists or not. And the second piece is uh, what is called a chain router, which allows you to chain multiple different co differently configured router implementations. So in that sense, with the CMF, you can use this um, the first router in that chain could be the static router for Symfony 2, which is very, very fast, obviously, because it need, does need to do database lookups. So for example, your home page, which you know you will always have, you just statically configure rather than putting it in a database. Um, and then after, if that first router does not find a match, then it could go to a dynamic uh, router. And then you could even configure another one, which sort of the fallback if content does not exist and people are looking for it, do something smart, I don't know, could be the next router. So these are the two pieces that the routing system offer. Yes? We don't have anything specific to that. Um, User-generated content. Um, uh, I, I, I think somebody has worked on integrating that with a comments bundle or something like that. But um, so we don't necessarily have anything specific there. However, you can put your user generated content into like a um, specific tree structure, and then you can, um, in PHPCR, you have the ability to reference things. So you can have like, you can have your your own uh, crafted content, and then you can have a reference to the ge user generated content that you can have, or you can have that as a child, or and things like that. But we don't have, I don't have a great example to show you with user generated content at this point. Yes? No, it's entirely separated. Um, so no, you don't need to use it. And actually, the first we we had one big client project uh, where we were weren't using the CMF at all because it didn't exist at the time. But yeah, you can use it entirely independent of the CMF, um, and that's why I'm saying that that's why I, ke I keep pitching that to Drupal. And actually, in fact, we recently changed the license. Um, because previously we were Apache licensed, so we now also MIT licensed. So we do a license uh, in order to sort of enable GPL-based CMSs to uh, to use PHPCR. Um, and there's a if you go to PHPCR.github.io, um, there's lots of documentation there on how to use it. And the same thing applies to this object mapper on top of PHPCR that we have. So where you can just have objects and then define how these objects are supposed to be persisted and you can just tell this PHPCR ODM, that's what it's called, to just persist that object state. That is also independent of the CMF and it's built on top of Doctrine. Um, and so it, it's, for anybody familiar with Doctrine ORM, they should be uh, able to really quickly start working with PHPCR ODM because the main uh, persistence APIs are the, exactly the same. So I think I'm over over the time and nobody is raising their hand, but I'll be around for today and uh, at least until uh, I think lunch tomorrow. Uh, so if you have any more questions, ask me. Other than that, um, my website is putiweed.org. Um, I think there's some contact information on there and my Twitter handle is lsmith. Um, and uh, my email address is also here. If I think if you click here, my email. And uh, I generally, I think I can claim that I answer every email that I ever get from anybody in the open source community. So if you have questions, email me. It can be general Symphony 2 questions, or you can also ask me about Ultimate Frisbee, which is also my passion. But, um, but yeah, so thank you for listening, um, and have a great conference. <laughs>